All right, welcome back everyone. And today we're going to get into our seed plants. So we previously talked about the seedless plants. Now we'll talk about the first of our seed plants, the gymnosperms. But before I do that, before we get into the gymnosperms, let's talk about how seed plants evolve. In seed plants, the evolutionary trend leads to the dominant sporophyte generation. If you remember, that means um, the diploid plant, the sporophyte, in which the larger and the more ecologically significant generation is the diploid plant. This leads to the redu reduction in size of the gametophyte. When we talked about the club mosses and the ferns, those are the seedless vascular plants. They're mostly homosporous, which means they produce only one type of spore. In contrast, all of the seed plants, or the spermatophytes, are heterosporous, meaning that they form two types of spores, megaspores, which are the female, and microspores, which are the male. Megaspores develop into the female gametophytes that produce eggs, and the microspores mature into the male gametophytes that generate sperm. Adapting to drought, like we had said in, our, in all of our plants, right, when you're moving on to land, adapting to drought is going to be an important obstacle to colonizing land, especially if you want to move away from uh, bodies of water. Seeds and pollen are going to distinguish the seedless vascular plants from the seeded vascular plants. And these seed plants are going to arise 350 million years ago. You get the pollen grains that are able to carry the male gametes of the plant away from the originating plant and to another plant. The small haploid cells are encased in a protective coat that prevents desiccation, which is drying out, and mechanical damage. Pollen can travel far from the sporophyte that bore it, and that's important because you don't want to do any inbreeding. We'll talk about that in a second. Seeds offers the embryo protection, nourishment, and a mechanism to maintain dormancy for tens or even thousands of years. It allows it to survive in a harsh environment and ensures germination when growth conditions become optimal again. You could have a packet of seeds sitting on your desk for your entire lifetime and then finally decide one day, okay, fine, I'll plant it today and it should grow no problem given the, the correct growth conditions. Seeds also allow plants to disperse the next generation through both space, getting away from the original plant, and time. Like I said, you could plant whenever you want. With these evolutionary advantages, seed plants become the most successful and, of course, the most familiar group of plants to us. Okay, so that's just a little bit about the generalization of, of seed plants. Now let's talk about the first type, the gymnosperms. Gymnosperms means naked seeds. Sperms, of course, means seed, and gymno means naked. And you can remember this because the Greeks, the early Greeks, um, when they practiced their sports, they did so in a gymnasium, and they did that naked. So uh, they played sports naked in the gymnasium. Gymnosperms means naked seeds. Gymnosperm characteristics include, of course, naked seeds that are open to the environment, having separate male and female gametes, being able to be pollinated by wind and animals, and also structures called tracheids, which transport water and solutes in the vascular system. Okay, let's take a look at the life cycle of conifers. So pine trees, by the way, they are conifers, um, and they carry both male and female sporophylls on the same plant. Like all gymnosperms, pines are heterosporous, and they produce male microspores and female megaspores. In the male cones right here, um, also called the staminate cones, the microsporocytes give rise to microspores by meiosis. The microspores then develop into pollen grains. Down here, you'll see a pollen grain. Each pollen grain contains two cells, one generative cell that will divide into two sperm and a second cell that will become a pollen tube. You can see the pollen tube stretching down into the seed right here. In, in the spring, pine trees release large amounts of yellow pollen. I'm sure that you're all aware of this. And it gets carried by the wind. Some gametophytes will land on a female cone. Here's the female cone, the cones that we're most familiar, familiar with. 
And the pollen tube grows from the pollen grain slowly, right here, and the generative cell uh, in the pollen grain divides into two sperm cells by mitosis. One of the sperm cells, here they are, the two, um, one of the sperm cells will finally unite its haploid nucleus with the haploid nucleus of an egg cell. That process, of course, is called fertilization. And then the female cones, or the ovulate cones, contain two ovules per scale. One megasporocyte undergoes meiosis in each ovule, but only a single surviving haploid cell will develop into a female multicellular gametophyte that encloses the egg. Once fertilization happens, the zygote will give rise to the embryo, which is enclosed in a seed coat of tissue from the parent plant. Fertilization and seed development is a long process in pine trees. It might take up to two years after pollination. The seed that's formed contains three generations of tissue. The seed coat that originates from the parent plant tissue, the female gametophyte uh, that will provide nutrients, and the embryo itself. And so you don't need to know every step of this process, but a couple things that I want you to remember are that in order for this, this seed to be made, you have to uh, combine the female megaspore and the male microspore. And they are both haploid, and then they produce the diploid seed that can turn into the diploid sporophyte or the mature tree. Another thing that I want you to remember is that female cones actually grow in the upper branches of the trees where they can be fertilized by pollen that's blown on the wind from other male cones. But the male cones that are on the same tree occur in the lower branches. So why is that important? Well, it's important because, and this happens because, this organism and this species does not want to self-pollinate. Self-pollination is like, is basically inbreeding, where you, why do humans not want to have children with their, you know, siblings or cousins? It's because it can lead to a lot of generative diseases, and inbreeding is never a good idea. And so that is the way, this is the one way that, um, one of a few ways, I should say, that a, um, that this organism tries to prevent inbreeding, is to keep the female cones on the upper branches, and the male cones on the lower branches. Um, okay, so I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on from that slide. If you have any questions about the life cycle of conifers, please let me know. Let's look at the diversity of gymnosperms. There's four major divisions, and they comprise about a thousand described species, and we'll just go through them pretty quickly and look at them and, and look at some of their features. There's the coniferophyta, the cycadophyta, the ginkophyta, and the netophyta. So let's take a look. Okay, coniferophyta are, of course, the conifers. They're the dominant phylum of gymnosperms, the most variety of species. You're probably all very familiar with them. They have scale or needle-like leaves that limit water loss. Snow slides off the branches and it limits the weight the branches have to hold. They have adaptations to cold and dry weather, which explains the predominance of conifers at high altitudes and in cold climates. These are your pines spruces, firs, cedars, sequoias, and yews. Some are actually even deciduous, even though you would think most of them as being, uh, as being evergreens. Some, which are the tamaracks, are actually deciduous and they lose their leaves in the winter, interestingly enough. The wood has no vessel elements, so it's referred to as soft wood, which is good for paper. Here are the conifers. Here's a sequoia, one of the largest trees ever. Uh, look, that's a, a child here, but uh, here, maybe that's what an adult looks like standing next to them. These are the biggest trees, um, obviously uh, very, very impressive, and they are in danger. Uh, but you only find them in one small place, uh, basically out um, on the west coast. Here is a uh, blue um, spruce tree. This, uh, I believe, is um, a yew, and here is tamarack, uh, the deciduous uh, conifer. So, pretty interesting trees. The next are the cycads. The cycads thrive in mild climates, and they often get mistaken for palms, and you'll see why. They have large cones, and they strangely get pollinated by beetles instead of the wind, like the rest of, the, of, of what we're talking about. They actually dominated during the time of the dinosaur, but they are endangered now. 
here's what they look like. You could ex you could see why they might get uh, sort of confused for palms. They sort of look like they have palmate leaves, but these are actually uh, gymnosperms, and they have a cone. Okay, they have conifer. They are conifers, and they have cones. So really interesting. Um, okay, then the next is the ginkgo phyte. Um, there is just a single surviving species. One of my favorite trees. Its fan-shaped leaves are unique among seed plants because they feature a dichotomous venation pattern. They turn yellow in autumn and fall from the plant all at once. I'll show you a video of that. For centuries, Buddhist monks cultivated ginkgo biloba, ensuring its preservation. It is planted in public spaces because it is unusually resistant to pollution. It has male and female organs that are found on separate plants. Usually you only want male trees to be planted by your gardener because the seeds produced by the female have an off-putting smell of rancid butter. Um, and here is a, a video of one of my friends uh, from my undergrad days. Um, we had a single ginkgo tree on our campus and he saw that the, the leaves were all about to fall off. So he goes over and gives them their final push. If you want to see this happen, you pretty much got to be there on that day because within a, a period of 24 hours, all the leaves fall off. So he, unfortunately, I couldn't get that video to play, but I'll be sure to get you a link to the video uh, so you can check it out if you want. It's kind of interesting seeing all the leaves fall off at one time. Let's keep going. The next are the netophytes, the closest relatives to the angiosperms, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. They have broad leaves like angiosperms. Um, but there's three dissimilar genera that all fall into the netophyta. The netum, the wellwichia, and the ephedra. Netum is a species that are mostly vines, and you find them in the tropical and subtropical zones. Kind of interesting having these red berries on them. Here's wellwichia. This is a really interesting plant that might live for well over 2,000 years. Uh, you can find them in desert areas. And here's ephedra. The genus ephedra is represented in North America in the dry areas of the southwestern United States and Mexico. They have small scale-like leaves that are the source of the compound ephedrin, which is used in medicine as a potent decongestant. But because ephedrin is so similar to amphetamines, both in chemical structure and the neurological effects, its use is restricted to prescription drugs. Like angiosperms, but unlike other gymnosperms, all netophytes possess vessel elements in their xylem. Here is ephedra. So its use is highly restricted, uh, basically because it has very similar uh, effects as methamphetamines. And with that, guys, sorry for all the technical difficulties in this one, uh, but I will see you in the next one.